We didn't arrive at the Bohr model by chance, it had to be developed carefully over time by careful thought and experimentation. And it goes a little something like this. We start with Democritus in ancient Greek who first theorised the idea that all matter is made out of particles which are indivisible, you can't break them down any further, and he called them atoms. And then John Dalton did some work on chemistry in uh, 1800, so we've gone a long way where that, that model hasn't changed. And he said that, okay, they're all atoms were indivisible, they couldn't be broken down, but different elements were different atoms. So oxygen was one type of atom, carbon was another type of atom, and so on. But basically they had no structure, they were fundamental, they were unbreakable. Thompson, however, discovered the electron by working with these things called cathode rays. And he said, therefore, it can't be the case that an atom is the smallest thing. It can't be a case that an atom is indivisible because we found something which comes from an atom. We found something smaller than an atom, an electron. So he actually theorized his model was that the atom was a bit like a plum pudding. It had this positive kind of cakey stuff, this evenly distributed positive charge. And within that, there were some electrons that were the negatively charged particles that could be taken out of the atom. Rutherford did his experiment and concluded that actually there must be a nucleus. All of the positive charge must be within a really small concentrated point with all of the mass as well, or the majority of the mass really. All of the positive charge and most of the mass must have been concentrated in one small point which he called the nucleus or kernel of the atom. A tiny point with most of the mass and all of the positive charge. The Bohr model, as we use it today, adds the idea of the nucleus itself is split down into protons and neutrons, and that the electrons have a certain amount of energy in fixed energy levels at which they orbit. The most important part about this topic is that models explain evidence. If a model doesn't explain the evidence, then we have to change it. So Rutherford's evidence came from this experiment, the alpha particle scattering experiment. He fired some alpha particles at a really thin piece of gold foil, and he found that most of them, as he was expecting with the plum pudding model, would go straight through. But some of them were deflected, that's pathway number two. And some of them, miraculously, amazingly, bounced straight back. Some of them came back the way they came, and this was incredible to him. If the plum pudding model was correct, then all of those alpha particles should have gone straight through the gold foil. Most of them did, most alpha particles went straight through, that's path one. Some were deflected, and very few actually came back the way they came. And that's an important thing that he noticed. Some of them did go back the way they came. So they had to change the model. If we could imagine zooming in on some of those atoms and some of those paths, we would have something that maybe looked like this. The, and this is the nuclear model. The red positive points here in this diagram are the nuclei that Rutherford added to the model. He changed the plum pudding model because it didn't fit with the evidence that he now had. The conclusions that he made were most of the atom is empty space. So most of the alpha particles went straight through because most of the atom is nothing at all. The second conclusion is that the nucleus must be charged because if it's got to exert a force on those particles, it's got to be charged. And the third conclusion is that to deflect an alpha particle, which they knew had a really high kinetic energy, it must have a lot of mass. It must have a great deal of mass to be able to deflect the alpha particle back the way it came and not just be barged out of the way by the alpha particle. I would strongly recommend that you memorize those observations and those conclusions about Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment. So a really core bit of information about how we arrived at this model, this way of explaining the atom, is that when new evidence arises, which can't be explained by the old model, we have to reject or change the old model. Scientists change the models based on the evidence that they have. It starts with Dalton, and there was evidence that actually there was another particle, cathode ray tubes, beams of electrons. That led to the Thompson model, the plum pudding model. Thompson model was changed after the alpha particle scattering experiment, Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment that I've just described to you, and that led to the Rutherford nuclear model. From the Rutherford nuclear model, then we realise the electrons must have had some energy if they were to stay in orbit. So that gives rise to the energy levels. And also Chadwick discovered the neutron. And now we have the Bohr model. Evidence changes models. The story doesn't stop there, uh, but you don't need to describe any more evidence other than the alpha particle scattering experiment. That's the key one to focus on. You need to know that the models changed because of new evidence, but you don't need to describe, for example, Chadwick or Bohr's evidence. You just need to really know in detail that alpha particle scattering experiment, how we know that most of the atoms empty space and that there is a positive and dense nucleus.